Welcome to a Best Practices for Delivering a Course Online. Nice to see everyone here today. My name is Tracy Miller, and I'm the Online Teaching Coordinator in Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center. Here's just some contact information for me. OK. Um, Matt, I see you have, oh, you, you might just have turned your microphone off, just giving you the fair warning that we might be able to hear you. <laughs> okay, my workshop objectives for this afternoon is um, to come up with some practical strategies on how you might communicate with your students, um, how you might grade your students' work online, and then different ways you can support your online students. So hopefully I accomplish that today. Um, in these workshops, um, what I often bring up first is this sort of online quality pie. There's a lot of different things that make up quality in an online course. And here's just kind of them chunked into different units. How the course is designed, um, your course content that you're adding to the course, are institutional infrastructure. Um, how do we support online teaching and learning at the university? Our LMS, our learning management system here at NIU is Blackboard. And then your readiness to teach online and your students' readiness to become an online student. So I mentioned everyone except for the one that has the box around it. And that's because what we're talking about today is course delivery. Course delivery is that teaching. There's a lot of things that go into the planning and the development of an online course or your Blackboard course, um, but what's actually happening when you are delivering the course? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and this is the beginning of our series of quality online teaching. So um, we're going to be really talking about things in a very generalized way. Each one of the things that I'm going to bring up here today um, also has sort of a corresponding one hour workshop all on its own. So things are going to go fast. Um, but again, if you want to know any more detail about it, um, then go ahead and come to our more detailed workshop, uh, look for the workshop recording, or just shoot me an email or give me a phone call and we can talk about this, maybe more specific to the way you like to teach online. So again, my three objectives, how are we going to communicate with our students, how are we going to grade or assess our students, and then how are we going to support their learning. This is not so different than what you do in a face-to-face -face course. You're going to be doing all of these things with your students in a face-to-face -face course. So what's different? Well, I would say what's different is the approach that you're going to take with your student. And that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Let me just take a quick break and check our attendance. It looks like I still have everyone, and it looks like Mossy's successfully in there. So welcome to this uh, workshop. So the first thing we're going to talk about is communicating with your students in an online course. And you really want to be intentional about this um, because there is that disconnect of time and space. And so and a really important thing to have your students feel like they belong to this course um, and that they have some um, part of this course is to get to know each other. So let's think about um, a little bit deeper about why we need to get to know each other. And I think part of it is the student's motivation. Think about what the student's motivation is for taking this course. And you can make some assumptions, um, like we're going to do here. But as you get to know each other, you're going to get to know more about what their motivation for taking this course is. Um, so I have broken it down into these different categories. I think students are have their own self-interests. Um, this may be an, op an option for them because of things going on in their lives. Um, and 
you know, they're definitely thinking about themselves. And so what sort of things can you do um, to help tap into those self-interests? Well, one of the ways to do that is to share something personal about yourself, personal but not intimate. So um, what do I mean by that? And, you know, everybody has their different comfort levels and what that means. But share a hobby. Um, share something that, else that you may be doing uh, professionally besides teaching this course right now. Um, you know, but maybe you're not going to tell them that you've had this horrible headache all day long and, um, and you know, something that you're not really comfortable with sharing with them. That is just fine. But what's going to happen as you share some of these personal things with your students is they may find a connection with you. So, for instance, um, in the fall, I got a new dog, and so that might be something that I would share with the students. I don't feel uncomfortable sharing that. Maybe I'm going to post a picture of the new dog. Um, and then a student may also say that they have a dog. And then we sort of have this, this connection, this thing that we can talk about a little bit. Um, and so that's the next bullet point, which is to express some interest in their lives. And maybe it's not so much about their new dog, but maybe. Um, you understand um, why they're responding some way because they've shared something um, that's part of their lives with you. And you can kind of tap into that. Uh, I use that a lot. Actually, I have my students do a reflective journal each week. And um, they may say something about the content. They may say something about um, how wonderful they thought the discussion board prompt was this week. Um, but they might also express how they had a really heavy week because they had a, a parent or a partner um, that was very ill. Um, and so all that, again, is making these connections with your student. Um, the next one, your student's academic life. Um, obviously, that's why we're all here, right, is the student's academic life. And so, uh, some of the ways that you can help students and their motivation through their academic life is to really let them know um, what your expectations are and how they can meet them um, because they want to do well in the course. Um, you know, we want to give them that benefit of the doubt. Um, they may also have, um, this may be a gen ed course or a slightly off program course, anything that you can let them um, kind of tap into why this course is still important to them is going to help with their um, motivation in the course. And then this last one, the student's future professional life. And I say future professional life, but oftentimes online students already have a professional life um, and that's why they're taking an online course. So any way that you can acknowledge their current professional life but also how can you um, show that passion and enthusiasm for your profession and this discipline that you may be sharing to really help them see how this is going to help them in their future career, in their present professional life. Um, and you're going to sort of realize that as you get to know each other in the course. I see some new folks coming in, so I'm just going to make sure that I keep up with my attendance. We're just starting to talk about how important it is to get to know each other um, and how to communicate with your students in an online course. And so here's those practical strategies I said that we are going to have. First one I would recommend is to use the Blackboard profiles. Uh, this is something that um, students can add um, a picture to, a profile picture to. You can see they also have these tiles um, that they can add, for instance, their major, um, different organizations that they're part of. Um, just uh, You can see there's just a variety of things in there. The real advantage is specifically in a course for having your students add these profiles is that you will be able to see their picture in the discussion board. So you won't just see a silhouette. You'll see their face, and you'll be able to kind of put a face to the person. Um, 
when you hover over them, when you're grading that reflective journal like I was talking about, you'll see this sort of um, short version of their profile pop up and it will remind you of what their major is. Um, one of the ones I really like is how far along they are in their program. Um, so if you're teaching, um, let's say, a 300 level course like I do, and um, you, I have couple freshmen, you know, many juniors and seniors, it's nice to know um, if I see those juniors kind of where they're at in their program. Um, I might give them um, some more pointers. They might be more stressed out. There's a whole thing, um, a lot of things that could be happening, but having those profiles um, really help you to get to know your students. And please, if there's anything that's kind of um, jumping out at you and you want to know more information about them, put something in the text chat area um, at the bottom of the page there. Otherwise, again, I'm going to have to go through things really quickly. So I'm kind of on, on speed mode here. Um, but I'm certainly very happy to answer any questions as they come up. OK, communicate frequently. This is another strategy for you. Um, again, just so the students know that they're not just interacting with a computer, um, that there is communication. There's some of your presence in the course. Communicate with them frequently. Um, Alicia said, welcome to the first day of the semester. If you are teaching an online course, you probably want to communicate even before that first day of the semester, especially if it's an accelerated course, which is um, definitely happens a lot in online courses. So send out those reminders, send out those introductions. Uh, the first example I have at the top is just an example of a Blackboard announcement. Um, so not only could you be welcoming your students with announcements right now, um, but as those first due dates start to come up, use your announcement tool to remind your students um, that something is coming due. Uh, usually these are sort of more at the beginning of the course as you're kind of training them in how the course is going to unfold. So reminders are a great tool for that. Um, you can also include a course link in the reminder. So if you want to put them right into unit one, right into um, the first week or the second week, use those course links. They're very helpful. Um, some new upgrade features. This is actually an upgrade that happened last May, um, but I always like to kind of keep these in in case you didn't get to use it last semester and now you're kind of incorporating some new things into your course. Um, there is a send reminder feature. So what I have here is a screenshot of um, the Grade Center. And in various different cells, I see there are some needs grading icons, that exclamation point. Um, but I also see some are missing. So maybe I'm going to send out that reminder, maybe the morning of the due date, uh, just to kind of coax these students along a little bit. Um, from that top is a drop-down menu that many of you have seen. There's now one that says send reminder. And so that's going to send a reminder to the students ha who have not submitted anything yet. Just a little push uh, to get them to do that. Really easy to do. In the past, that might have been um, identifying the six students that were missing them and um, sending them individual emails, maybe blind copying them. Um, using the Blackboard email, this is just, a, it just makes it that much easier. This is in the gradebook. Yes, it is. So if you go into the full grade center and you pick that um, assignment that's maybe coming due, um, go to the top of the column and that's where you'll find it. Thank you, Isabel. Good question. So my next um, sort of strategy is to let your students know 
when you plan to respond to them um, in various different ways. So I have added to my instructor page my communication expectations. And I specifically said um, how often I will be posting to the question and answer discussion forum and how soon they can expect a response from me. And then I've also let them know that if they have a more private question, they can get a hold of me through email and that I will do my best to respond within 24 hours. Um, at the top, I do recommend responding within 24 to 48 hours. Um, that, that's just kind of a general um, standard. You may have other communication expectations. Um, if you are um, less likely to respond during the day, if you're more likely to respond during the day, um, if you do like to hold off responses over the weekend, whatever it is that fits you, the important part is that um, you're, you're letting them know what that is. Um, also, with the 24 to 48 hours, uh, that may need to be um, ramped up if the course is shorter, or you maybe um, can spread it out a little bit if you are working with a 16-week a course. Um, but the important part is to let them know when you're going to respond, and then really commit to doing that. Um, hold them off. If they're emailing you at 3 o'clock in the morning, um, don't feel obligated to be checking on that kind of thing. Remind them that um, they, in the morning, remind them that you have 24 hours to get back to them, um, that perhaps their question could be asked in the discussion board help forum and other students might be able to um, respond to them. Um, use media. This is just another idea. So if you do a welcome announcement every week and use the Blackboard announcements, that is wonderful. That is fine. Um, this is just a different way that you can um, kind of connect with your students, and that's using um, a video. And now this is a screenshot of me doing one of my welcome videos and um, just sitting in my office like I am today. And um, you can use um, YouTube. You can use uh, the medial uh, video server here on campus. You can use your cell phone. Um, my introductions um, to the week and even to the course, um, I script them out. I create a transcript of them for the students. Um, but I keep them pretty informal. Um, I don't take myself too seriously with them. I think it makes me a little bit more human and, and help me connect with the students a little bit more. Um, can you just use an audio announcement? Um, if you used an audio announcement, um, you could use some kind of audio captioning tool, um, or you could I'm trying to think of the right tool. Um, if you have any kind of podcasting tool or something like that, Audacity, exactly, you could do that. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, a video, because I know a lot of us can be uncomfortable with that. Or maybe we are we know we need to get an announcement out, and um, we've got a pile of laundry behind us. <laughs> or you could upload the announcement page or you upload in the announcement page. Yeah, the, the announcement, I think what you would probably use is a link to something that you've created uh, some kind of audio for. So Sarah asks, so if you do an audio announcement or video announcement or audio, do you offer a transcript for accessibility purposes? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, it is actually required um, for any video um, that you create um, 
for students with hearing disabilities. Um, so you would need to create a transcript. Um, you would need to create closed captioning um, if it was something that was um, that the students needed to see that, like a step-by-step -step instruction. If it was more informational, um, like an announcement, then um, a transcript would be um, fine. I use um, YouTube actually to do my um, transcriptions and that also keeps it really short for me. It reminds me to keep my um, welcome announcements really short. It's also why I start with a script. Um, sometimes the script, is, um, I go off script, but at least if I start with that script, I just need to make a few little um, tweaks for the transcription. Um, definitely reach out to us if anyone wants to know more about how to add um, transcriptions to their audios. But that is an entire workshop on its own. Um, every time I do this workshop, and if you've already been a part of it, um, I try to add new things as they kind of become available to me. So this is a new one. Um, last week we had Tom Tobin here in faculty development to do a um, universal design workshop for our Teaching Effectiveness Institute. Um, but I also had a chance to see him do a recent webinar. And um, the research that he's been doing um, on how often you should be communicating and interacting with your students in a discussion board. They've been doing research on this. Um, it really hasn't even fully been published, but they've been doing the uh, research behind it. it. Says that faculty should participate in discussion boards about 10% of the time. That is sort of the sweet spot. So um, what does that mean? That means that you're not responding necessarily to every single um, discussion board post, um, but you are tapping in about 10% of the time. And really that's, uh, I would say, maybe just a typical kind of discussion board. There may be really reasons that you don't want to tap in, and there may be reasons why you do need to respond to every single discussion board. Um, but I do get this question on occasion, how often should I be responding to the discussion forums? So I thought it was worth adding into this area. Um, my next piece of advice for communicating with your students in an online course is using the Retention Center. So um, Retention Center is one of those things that I think um, is kind of underutilized at this point. Um, but you can find it under evaluation in the control panel of your Blackboard left-hand navigation. Um, it's used for at-risk students to let them know um, if you see them demonstrating any of these at-risk behaviors. Um, so it, it is sort of an assessment tool, um, but I really like to use it here for a, a communication tool because, again, if you see students in um, this at-risk table and you want to communicate with them in a timely manner, um, using your retention center is a really good tool for that. It might be something that you're already using for students that you're noticing in the grade center that they're really falling behind. This grade center, or retention center, is capturing a lot of that information that can kind of um, distill that information down for you. Um, so again, Retention Center could, is, a, is an hour-long workshop, but just bringing it down to the basics here. It's looking for students that have missed deadlines, if their grades are below a certain class average, their overall activity in the course, and how often they've accessed the course. And so um, in this case, Leonardo here has um, really triggered a few alerts. So if I want to notify him um, and kind of maybe suggest a, a conference call or some sort of intervention, I can just click on this notify button at the top um, and it will send him an email. And there's a default message in there. I usually personalize the default message a little bit, again, with that suggested intervention in there. 
very similar to sending them out an email. The benefit to this one is you're going to have this notification history at the bottom. So that's your reminder that you may have already reached out to Leonardo. Maybe it's time to reach out again. Or maybe it's just sort of um, that tracking information that you have reached out to the student maybe several times and they don't seem to be re-engaging in the course. So I definitely like to use the Retention Center. Um, for that communications tool for that at-risk student. So I am going to switch gears. We're going to talk about grading a little bit. Um, but I do want to pause for a minute to see if anyone has any questions. Um, just add them to the text chat area. If you did come into the course a little bit later, you can access the uh, text chat area, text chat area by going to the bottom right hand of the page. There's a purple um, and white set of arrows, and then clicking on the text chat area. OK, feel free to keep typing in there if you are with any of your comments or questions. Um, but I will sort of move on in the interest of time. So when you're grading your students, again, some practical strategies when you're in the moment when you're uh, teaching an online course. And part of this is, um, is some planning, because we know things are going to come up and, and maybe adjust how things are going to happen in the course. So one of the things you can do to keep your students and yourself on track is to um, let them know what kind of assignments, grading criteria, and grading practices, procedures that you're going to have in the course. And this is probably something that you're going to um, have in your course syllabus. I would recommend also adding it maybe in your course information area. Um, and that is so your students um, will have it in a, in a very obvious place and maybe even a couple places that they can know where to look for. Um, a really good way, though, to keep your students and yourself on track is to commit to and let your students know when they will receive feedback and grades from you. And by kind of um, adding it here, you are really committing to that. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about um, strategies on how you determine um, how soon your feedback and your grades can be to the students. So in this case, I've told students that it will be posted within three days of the assignment due date. Um, so, and I also tell them, so for most days, this is a Wednesday following the due date. I make uh, most of my due dates on a Sunday. Um, and so this is, has a couple different benefits. One is, um, you know, you're going to have three days to grade. Um, hopefully, they're not going to be bugging you the next day. Um, you can kind of push them back and say, no, grading will be done um, in three days. Um, so don't bug me yet. Um, but then it's also your reminder that, you know, you go, you're going to kind of need to get these things done. Um, this one in particular, my three-day grading works because um, it happens right before the next due date. Thursdays, I usually have my students do their initial post to the discussion forum. And so they're going to benefit from any of my feedback um, before they get to sort of the next due date. So again, I said, how did I pick that date? How are we going to pace ourselves? I pull out a calendar. I look at the course calendar, and, um, and I look at my, you know, my professional calendar and faculty development. And I'm really trying to make sure this is going to work for me. Um, it also has to do with the due dates I, I pick. So you know, I seem to be able to um, work well with having a Sunday due date, having a couple days to grade. Again, I like it before that initial post on Thursday. If it makes sense for you to have a Friday due date because you really like to do your grading 
um, over the weekend. That's that's what's going to work for you, and kind of pulling out that calendar um, is is going to help you plan that out. Um, if there's a big paper coming up, and you know that big paper is going to take, um, you know, a week to grade, um, notice that on that calendar. Change your due date. Um, change your grading practice. Um, that's going to work for kind of that big paper scenario. Um, if there is um, anything else on your calendar, you're going to a conference, um, you know this um, major meeting's coming up. Um, again, look at that and see if that's going to work. Because we don't want you to get stressed out in the middle of the semester when things are happening um, and these things jump up at you. You're doing a little bit of uh, planning in there. If something does come up suddenly that you're not expecting, let your students know um, that this week grading is going to take a little bit longer um, and again, recommit to a new time frame. That's fine. Um, it, it'll bring everybody's stress level down. Um, some new benefits, again, with some of the new upgrades that happened last May. Um, one is the um, something that I see that come, comes across once in a while. Um, but if you allow your students multiple attempts on an assignment or even a test, um, in the past, what you've seen if you go to needs grading is there um, are sort of all of their attempts there. And you just kind of need to click through them um, to get to that final one that you need to grade. Now, you can actually change the setting to say um, either don't show the attempts that need to be graded um, or show them. And there's different reasons why you might want either option. But I think um, one of the, the handy ones now is going to say, no, don't show all of the attempts. Only show me the attempts that are going to contribute to their grades. And that kind of cleans up your, uh, your grading workflow a little bit. The other feature, Love this one. I'm looking forward to hearing more um, from faculty about how this one's working for them. But you can now, when you upload an assignment, when a student uploads an assignment, um, you're going to see this submissions um, tag at the top. Success, your submission appears on this page. Um, it's going to give them that peace of mind that when they hit submit, it worked correctly. It's also going to give you um, a number that can be looked into. Uh, the, the service desk might be able to trace it if somehow the dog ate the online homework. Um, and that the students are encouraged to copy and save this number for um, proof. And, um, and that's a number also that, that you can use and look into um, to kind of track down um, what might have happened to the student's submission. So um, that might be a new part of your instructions to suggest that the students copy um, this submission number down um, in order to follow up with you if they find that they cannot find their their submission afterwards. Um, and again, just kind of proof tracking that a submission has been um, submitted. But also, um, it might give them a pause if they, they're going to use the excuse that they, um, that they submitted something and now it's gone. Um, keep their, their honesty up there. Um, my next recommendation for grading is to use your Blackboard Interactive Rubrics. Um, and if you come to any of our rubric um, workshops here in faculty development, uh, we really suggest you use the interactive rubrics. Yes, they are work up front, but then you can use them over and over again or slightly adjust them. But they make grading so much easier. Um, not only do you make grading easier, but they're a quick feedback mechanism. So if there's something that students um, maybe are not meeting expectations, it's really easy um, 
to kind of just click on this bubble and you're giving them some quick feedback um, without sort of having to, to write up all this um, feedback into um, an email, into their grading feedback. Um, you're just kind of letting them know quickly how they did not meet your expectations. Um, and then if you do just want to be a little bit more personalized, a little bit more specific, it's so easy to add that feedback into any of these components of the interactive rubric. But there was a new upgrade. Um, I don't know if I'd call it an upgrade. It was a bug that was in the system forever and was really annoying. Um, you were unable to export um, rubrics. And um, that's a lot of times what we want to do from course to course. Um, we could use a course copy. Um, but then we were sort of um, pulling in all this content that maybe we didn't want. Uh, maybe we were borrowing a colleague's rubric. So the exporting rubric feature now works. Um, so you'll see that in your rubrics that there's an export and an import feature. Um, exports it, I think, as a zip folder. Again, you can share it with colleagues if you've, if you've always loved their rubric and you wanted to use it. Um, so we're excited that this exporting and importing of rubric feature now works. It'll make it a lot easier um, for all of us. Um, my next uh, best practice, my next uh, sort of suggestion strategy is to save common feedback phrases. Um, I, I don't know if I always say that I think we have this goal in mind and then we um, we never quite get to it. But I always like to say at the beginning of the semester like this, let's all recommit to starting our feedback bank, um, a Word document, um, a table of just some of the, that great feedback that we've used that we know um, happens time and time again with our students. Um, and so instead of retyping it and coming up with brilliant language every time to just sort of have this feedback bank. Um, I also think having a feedback bank really helps us remember that it's important to have positive and constructive feedback um, and that we've really um, made it measurable and observable for our students and very specific with our students. Um, and we might be more likely to have this great feedback if we're starting somewhere with a feedback bank. Then maybe we're mixing and matching um, the language, that specific support we're looking for. Um, but we're able to quickly do that because we've already had sort of this feedback structure. Um, just as an example for this, let's look at um, constructive and the second one here. Could you expand on this idea of reconstruction and include an example? So we've got something that's very specific because we're talking about the idea of reconstructing. And we're being really specific because and measurable because we want them to include an example. Maybe that's something they're going to do um, from a draft to a final um, written piece of work. But maybe it's a slightly different um, topic this time. So instead, we're going to ask them to be more concise about something rather than expand. And instead of including an example, um, we'd like them to cite their work. <laughs> you know, and then we can, again, see that they've cited the work and we can see that they've been um, a little bit more concise in their, their example. So um, again, I recommend coming up with a feedback bank, something that you can pull from um, when you're trying to give that great feedback to your students. Um, in our last sort of um, 15 to 20 minutes here, we're going to shift gear again uh, and start talking about how we can support our students and their success. I'm going to pause again for questions, um, but also ideas. Um, share some ideas that you've used in either communicating um, with your students in an online course or grading their work. Um, we're here to learn from each other. So I'd love to hear sort of your best strategy um, for
communicating with your students and assessing your students. And again, keep typing in as you'd like, but I will move on to supporting your students. Oh, okay, Sarah said, I found the rubrics really helpful for face-to-face -face courses also. Yes, absolutely, Sarah. Um, and many of these strategies uh, definitely work um, for your blended courses or your face-to-face -face courses. Um, they're, they're, you just may not have the opportunity um, for instance, like a getting to know you activity. You might do the first day of course like you're going to do this week. This is just sort of an alternate that you can do with your, your online students. Um, I like to do a getting to know you um, face to face and online for those students that maybe um, are absent the first week. Maybe they haven't been added to the course yet because we're still in that add drop time period. Um, it also helps to have um, that online getting to know you because you can always refer back to it. Which one of those students said that they just came back from um, a service mission in um, Haiti or something like that? You know, it's, it helps to kind of be able to go back and see that. Um, so here are some ideas, ways that you can support your online students and maybe even your face-to-face -face students. Um, and some, some of these are face-to-face um, -face activities that now we've just created an uh, electronic version for. Ismail says, the feedback feature is great. I'll try it this semester. Awesome. Great. You know where to find me if you need any help with that. Um, so conducting a, um, a survey with your students. So if you want to um, create a Blackboard survey or if you're using a Qualtrics survey, um, you know, it survey can be a variety of things. Is this a survey that's maybe um, some prerequisite knowledge that you were hoping for? You're just kind of checking on that. Um, is this a survey to find out what the students' goals are for the course? Having them sort of um, say it out loud or write it down um, kind of survey um, can be a good way to, again, communicate with your students, but it also couldn't be a good way um, to support them so that you understand where they're coming from and, and how you can help them that way. Next suggestion, host a virtual office hour. Um, you can use Blackboard Collaborate like we're using this afternoon. Um, this could be weekly, monthly, um, anything that makes sense to you. I do a virtual office hour um, before the um, sort of one of the major projects starts, and then I do a virtual office hour right before the final project starts. Um, I offer a couple different times. I also record it for those students that can't attend. Uh, Masi says, use more frequently announcements with concurrent emails to the class. Yeah, uh, in um, good suggestions, um, I the frequency of the communication uh, I, I think is really important, definitely a good po point. Um, so the, the virtual office hours can be um, scheduled. Um, I let the students know at the beginning of the semester when I plan on having them. Um, I also send out reminders. If a student reaches out to me um, and has specific needs, I can also use Blackboard Collaborate Ultra um, to do a um, just-in-time intervention type of office hour. So that works really well for that. Um, I can also use um, Skype for Business because we have the Microsoft 065 um, options here. So anything that you're comfortable with, Google Hangout, uh, virtual office hours are definitely doable. Um, provide your student with either frequently asked questions or question and answer forum. So um, 
if those frequently asked questions are always sort of popping up, um, you can create an FAQ. That's also your clue that maybe there's something that needs to be tweaked in the instructions. Maybe um, the navigation is slightly off. Um, but there's always new things that are going to come up. Um, so uh, give your students a place where they can find those answers. Um, save, saves you on email, too. Um, Sarah, you might have used this strategy in your face-to-face -face courses. Um, I've certainly used it in face-to-face um, -face things that I've done. Um, it's a strategy called the muddiest point. So anything that the students are really unclear about um, on a weekly, on a class-by-class um, -class basis, it gives them the opportunity uh, to kind of say, you know, this is just sort of unclear for me. And um, again, we might have done it in our face-to-face -face courses. I've done it with index cards where at the end of the class I'd say, okay, everybody write one thing you learned today and one thing that you're still confused about. This is just a way of doing that activity, um, but in an online course. It could be um, a reflective journal that we were talking about. It could be a discussion board. Um, it could even be um, something that you, you're getting a lot of emails from the students on and um, you want to kind of just in time create this opportunity for, um, for them to acknowledge that you've heard that they're confused about, about this and here's how we're going to solve it for them. Uh, there's other types of activities, uh, think pair share, if you want to create something where you want the students to partner off, have a little bit more of a private discussion, and then share out what they've learned. There are different ways to do these strategies with your online students. Um, a very easy strategy, though, is to remember your support units here at NIU, and then refer your students to them. So I'm going to start adding some into the text chat area. And this is just simply adding um, a link to these into your Blackboard course, but maybe also having them handy in case you notice a student is struggling somehow with something. The first one is the Do It Service Desk. So if they have any technology questions, send them to the Service Desk first. Um, they have uh, more hours available, um, and they definitely can help with those techie questions um, that may be more um, difficult for you. Um, let's send you a couple more. Um, this is a really good one. We were talking about um, accessibility earlier. You want to add that um, accessibility statement in your syllabus in your course, but also provide your students with a link to the Disability Resource Center. Um, that way those students that maybe have not disclosed to you or to the Disability Center um, may find those services now and they can get the help they need. Here is another one. Um, some services, academic services that are available to your students that they may not be aware of. Um, we're getting more and more services that are directly related for online students, um, but a lot of the services we already have have some of those um, online options. One of them is the Writing Center. So if you've noticed that your students um, really aren't at the writing level that they should be. Um, the Writing Center is now using Google Hangouts to have virtual uh, writing tutoring sessions. So that might be a really good one um, to give to your students um, if, they're, if they're struggling with that and you can again use your resources we have at the university. Here's another one. If any of your students are struggling with their gender or sexuality um, and you feel like it may be something that would really help them be successful, let them know about the different resource centers that are around campus. 
And then finally, another idea, and I'm hoping you're thinking of other ideas, knowing what you know about your students, is career services. Um, career services can be helpful with those online students that are looking to change careers, professions, or maybe advance in their own um, current profession. A lot of ideas that um, you may add to your course again in the design, but as you are delivering the course, you may um, find these needs. Just remember that it'll help you and your students to be able to provide them with these support units that we already have available here on campus. Well, we're sliding into the last seven minutes or so of the workshop. So here are some best practices. Didn't quite fit perfectly into any certain categories, so I just want to kind of call them out for you. Um, remember to use your student preview mode. Um, if there's any question that your students can't seem to find something, don't seem to see something, um, go ahead and use your preview mode. And you know, not only can you view the course as a student using student preview mode, but you can actually submit work. So if you want to see what it looks like from the student's perspective and then go back in, a, in instructor mode and try to grade your work, um, you can go ahead and toggle back and forth with that. Another great suggestion is to reverse your the order of your course. So if your course right now is designed to be um, unit 1 through 16, go ahead and flip those folders around. That way the content, uh, the most recent content is appearing up at the top. May really help um, you and your students in kind of looking for what they should be working on right now. Um, remember to set availability and time and date restrictions and due dates. So again, if you haven't already done that, um, go ahead and start doing that. And um, these are things that can be edited, um, the date and time restrictions. Um, probably more often than not. So if you if there's anything um, that you need to kind of stretch or collapse in, um, go ahead and kind of set those availability dates up for you and your students. Um, enable grading for the discussion forums. Um, that's just one of those things that folks forget to do. If they're doing a content-heavy discussion forum, um, click that button that says enable grading. It saves you a ton of time in your grading workflow because you're going to see all of the posts by um, a certain student in one area and you'll be able to grade it right from there rather than kind of combing through discussion forums making sure that student did their initial post and their two follow-up posts um, it just really helps the workflow to click that button and then finally to model the behaviors you want out of your student whether that's um, how often you communicate the degree of formality you might be using for communication, the level of part, um, professionalism that you're using um, in your messages. Um, just remember to model those behaviors um, to kind of reinforce that with your students. So in the last um, hour or so, we've talked about these different things, but if I was to just say a few words about each, communicate with your students often. We've heard that here. Um, grade your student work, but use the tools that are available to you. Um, don't forget they are there for you. Um, support your online students by using your resources um, that we have here. Manage your workload. Remember to take care of yourself, and that is going to help your students be more successful. Um, so thank you all for being with me here this afternoon. Um, I will hang out a little bit for questions, of course, um, but here is how you can get a hold of me. Um, if you have any follow-up questions or if you just want to talk more about an upcoming online course that you have, 
Um, yes, I am already talking to folks about their online courses for the summer and for the fall. Uh, never too soon to start thinking about that. Um, I will send the recording out to everyone um, once I have that kind of produced. Um, I'll also send you a link to our follow-up survey, um, but I did just add the survey um, into the text chat area if you want to take it right now. You're welcome, Bill. Good to see you again.